Are we starting soon? Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, uh, good evening, uh, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen of the press. Welcome to this launch event for our State and Trends and Adaptation Report 2022. I am delighted to present today the second volume of our series dedicated to the African uh, continent. My name is Patrick Fakoy, and I'm the CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation. And I'm very grateful that I will be joined today during this launch event by President Adeshina of the African Development Bank, African Union Commissioner, Yosef Asako, mm -hmm. Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohamed, State Secretary of Norway, Bjork Sankir, Petri Talas of the WMO, um, Lisbeth Steer of the Education Commission for high level statements. And right after my launch of the report uh, um, uh, now, it will be followed by a more technical presentation of the report by our co directors, Professor Jamal Sagir and Dr. Ede Ilias. So let's get going on the report itself. So, together with last year's report, the State and Trends and Adaptation is the most comprehensive and detailed analysis of climate adaptation solutions for Africa. With more than a thousand pages of analysis and solutions, 33 leading African and global research partners and coverage of all key economic and social sectors. These two reports are called by President Makisal of Senegal and Chairperson of the African Union as the Encyclopedia of Climate Adaptation for Africa. So today, I do not need to repeat to you that Africa is the continent with the greatest vulnerability to climate change. We have all seen the devastation climate change is already causing in the region, from the flood striking Niger, Sudan, South Sudan, and Mali, to the persistent drought in the Horn of Africa, and the three strong tropical cyclones smashing into Mozambique and other Southern African countries. Africa is in the eye of the storm. Pandemic recovery, fallout of the Ukraine crisis, the food and energy crisis. And on top of that, Africa is ground zero of the climate crisis. So our report does look at the damages of climate change in Africa indeed. But we don't stop there. We cannot simply state year after year the enormous drag that climate change imposes on economies and livelihoods. We must, we must focus on adaptation solutions, fast and at scale. And importantly, we cannot let the many other crises of the moment, rampant inflation, war, deepening energy and food crisis, displace the urgency of climate adaptation. Time. Ladies and gentlemen, time is running out. The clock is running down on the big decisions and actions that might prevent the looming catastrophe. We must, we must bring climate change back on the front line of the international agenda. And we must make it clear that adaptation is not a choice. It's not a choice. It is a necessity. Either we adapt or we die. So let me turn to the key messages of the report itself. And obviously it's impossible to summarize our detailed findings in just 10 minutes. So let me highlight three key messages. One, adaptation is indispensable to solving the food crisis in Africa. Two, while much more financing is needed for adaptation, it's also an economically smart investment for the region. It's smart economics. And three, adaptation must be everybody's business, not only the government. So let's turn to message one. Africa is urgently tackling its food crisis. And the world, the world must help. And climate adaptation must be part of these solutions. Last year in State and Trends 2021, we calculated that the cost, the cost of leaving climate adaptation aside in agriculture would be more than 200 billion US dollars annually. However, the cost of action is less than one tenth of that amount. An adapted agriculture sector only needs 
$15 billion a year investment. So in this year's report, we deepened our analysis of food system in Africa. The state and trends in African adaptation 2022, it looks at livestock, fisheries, and agroforestry. Let me just zoom in on livestock. Why? Because livestock accounts for 55% of household income in pastoralist communities. So what is climate change going to do to livestock in Africa? Well, heat stress alone will cause between 15 and 40, 40 billion US dollars of losses every year. And families that rely on livestock can't afford these losses. So the solutions, the solution, they exist from breeding and pest management programs to climate adapted land management and climate smart digital solutions that help herders and farmers make the right choices. The solutions to the food crisis in Africa must include decisive, fast, at scale, at scale adaptation action in crops, livestock, fisheries, and agroforestry. Let me turn to the second message of the report. Well, much more financing is needed for adaptation. It is, it is an economically smart investment for the region. The SDA report this year shows the numerous solutions and practical African experiences that already exist and have proven effective in adapting to a rapidly changing climate. So what is missing here? One big gap is funding, is financing for adaptation. Current annual spending on adaptation across Africa is how much? $11 billion a year, which is about 40% of all climate finance for the continent. So meeting the goals in countries' NDCs would require an additional $41 billion annually. So the financing gap a year is over 40 billion US dollars. In addition to this, what is a great concern to us in GCA is that of the $11 billion which is flowing today, more than 97% came from public actors. Hence, with less than 3% was tracked from the private sector. This is less than $250 million between 2019 and 2020. The good thing is, the opportunities to mobilize the private sector and to create more and better jobs for climate adaptation, they are immense. Adaptation investments cannot be seen as money lost. It's smart investment. So in last year's report, we showed that a dollar invested in weather and climate information series generates as much as $25 in return. Again, adaptation makes economic sense. This year, we expanded our analysis of the benefits of these adaptation programs in economic stimulus and recovery programs. Let me give you an example, Senegal. For the economy of Senegal, adaptation investment programs could create twice as many jobs within five years. Adaptation pays off. In short, investing in adaptation is a jobs agenda, a growth agenda, a prosperity agenda. Let me conclude with my third message of the report. Adaptation must be everybody's business. The private sector, communities, cities, and of course, the government must be part of the solution. Our survey of Africa medium and small enterprises shows the dramatic impact of climate change today. They told us that 75% saw a decrease in productivity, and over 70% saw a reduction in sales and incomes. The good thing, the flip side is, the private sector is also providing innovative solutions. Through our Youth ADAPT program, which we hold together with the African Development Bank, we are supporting creative entrepreneurs with locally grown adaptation solutions. And in our SDA report, you will see the stories of these entrepreneurs. Let me give you one story. Juveline Engum. She is the founder of Bleagley Waste Management. Her company identifies trash clogging drainage channels and waterways using drones. Today, Juveline employs 20 young workers and engages 
19 additional workers. She plans to expand with our support to hundreds of adaptation jobs within the next five years. So I invite you to read many more inspiring stories in the report. But these stories, these solutions, they need to go to scale and they need to go to scale fast. And while we do so, communities must be at the center of the design, implementation and upgrade of adaptation solutions. Lastly, let's turn to the cities. 79, 79, 79 of the world's fastest growing cities, they are in Africa, but infrastructure lags behind their growth. So we strongly argue in the report, it's not too late to fix this, particularly because many African cities are still in the early stages of development. That's why we developed a rapid climate risk assessment tool to help municipalities get ahead of the climate crisis. And the state and trends report this year shows the initial results. So, ladies and gentlemen of the press, we are publishing a report a few days ahead of COP27, the make or break summit for Africa. In the report, we talk about adaptation solutions that make economic sense. At the same time, we also show the enormous financial gap. For that reason, doubling finance flow for adaptation, the promise made in Glasgow just a year ago, it must be delivered. The good news is Africa already has a climate adaptation program. It is the triple AP the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, which we developed with the African Development Bank under the guidance and leadership of the African Union and the Africa Adaptation Initiative. What is the AAAP? It's primed to deliver $25 billion over five years. And since we launched it last year, together with President Arashina, a big brother of the African Development Bank, the AAAP has already influenced $3.5 billion worth of investments in 19 countries through its upstream financing facility. These are the first steps of financing adaptation at scale. The State and Trends Report gives a detailed summary of the program's initial success in food security, infrastructure, nature-based solutions, locally-led adaptation, and youth entrepreneurship. So for me, the bottom line is this. If COP27 is to succeed, it needs to ensure that adaptation finance is finally flowing at scale and pace to Africa. And let's be clear, that must mean billions of dollars, including through the climate action window of the ADF. So let me stop here. Our State and Trends in Adaptation 2022 report dives deep into the many complex issues that must be addressed at COP27 next week and beyond. But if I had to boil this down to one single message, for me, it would be this. We can no longer afford to wait. Adaptation must start happening on a far greater scale, and it needs a paradigm shift in investment. So a lot is riding on the outcome of the Sharm el Sheikh summit. We have, we have to make COP27 when we, the world doubles down on adaptation, a breakthrough moment. We need that for Africa. We need it for the world. We cannot afford to fail. I thank you very much for joining us during this launch event of the State and Trends 2022 report. And I'm looking at my colleagues joining me during the launch here to see whether President Arishina, president of the African Development Bank, and quite frankly, leader of the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, the man of action next week in Sharm el Sheikh, joining us during this occasion. President Arishina, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, and I hope you can hear me. Very well. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, to you, uh, Patrick, uh, Sir Patrick Bakwajian. Uh, thank you and your team uh, for the incredible job that you've done in putting together uh, this state and trends and adaptation report for 2021 and 2022. He's saying that first and foremost is that Africa is not responsible for the with global climate change. Africa only contributes 3% of the global emissions, but suffers disproportionately from the negative impacts of it. I feel that myself. It's not just even, let's leave the numbers alone. I went to uh, Cabo Verde, and when I traveled over there, they had not had rain almost five years. In fact, my arriving there was the same day that it actually had rain. And you can imagine, you can see a lot of it in times of increased drought, increased flood. You can see it in increased level of heat that you have that is actually affecting crops. The International Panel for Climate Change shows very clearly that what's going to happen is Africa will warm up faster than any other region of the world. And that's of course going to affect significantly crop output production, livestock production, and that will really significantly reduce incomes and livelihoods for farmers that form the majority of the population in Africa. So all, all that you're suffering from climate change. Africa is choking from climate change. And Africa is underfunded with finance it needs to tackle climate change. Today, Africa gets only 3% of global climate finance, which is disproportionate to the needs that actually uh, Africa has. Today, Africa is losing seven to $15 billion a year because of climate change. And if actions are not taken rapidly, that will grow to $50 billion a year by 2030. Our economies cannot continue to be stymied and our livelihoods of Africans are put at risk because of climate change. Let's be clear what this report does. In addition to what we have actually done at also the African Development Bank in partnership with the uh, Global Center for Adaptation, we know that Africa's needs to meet its climate actions on the Paris Agreement and to be able to also do climate financing is between 1.3 to $1.6 trillion by 2030. That brings the total value average to about $127 billion a year in climate finance. And yet, Africa gets only $18 billion in climate finance. So that leaves a balance of $110 billion in climate finance per year for Africa. For some, Vakrijan was just talking about the importance of the developed countries to pay up the $100 billion that was promised per year to developing countries to tackle climate change. Well, here is my own message. What Africa actually needs is a, it has a financing gap of $110 billion a year. That is more than even the $100 billion that we are talking about. Now, this report talks a lot about climate adaptation, which is Africa's main challenge, is adaptation. If you take, for example, how much we will need for climate adaptation for Africa, we have in this report a balance of anything about almost $41, $42 billion just for climate adaptation a year that we must mobilize. Now we are doing our part in doing that. We are not just folding our hands. The African Development Bank is together with the Global Center for Adaptation. We launched the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, which is Africa's largest effort. In fact, I must say it's the largest effort globally to tackle the issue of adaptation, climate adaptation is to raise $25 billion to support African countries to tackle climate adaptation. 
The African Development Bank has already put down on the table half of that amount, $12.5 billion. And we are looking to the rest of the world to actually come to the table with a balance of the $12.5 billion. At the African, at the Global Center for Adaptation, they are doing incredible work in mapping out what the needs are, mapping out how to make climate resilient for infrastructure. Already the upstream facility at the Global Center for Adaptation is doing so much analytical work to support countries to build climate resilience to their infrastructure, support them in agriculture, to mainstream climate financing into uh, national budgets, but also into the financing by multilateral development banks. And I'm very pleased to say that the Global Center for Adaptations work with us has already allowed us to mainstream over $1 billion of climate financing into our own operations because of that upstream facility. So that upstream facility should be fully funded. It needs $250 million and that should be fully funded because it's very critical to being able to mobilize more financing downstream. We have a downstream facility at the African Development Bank, which is called the African Development Fund. This climate African Development Fund, we are opening up a climate window. It's called a climate action window. This climate action window will mobilize resources of up to $13 billion to support 37 countries in Africa to tackle climate change. In fact, the most, the least uh, 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 able to and the most vulnerable countries. We are working with all of our donors and partners towards this, and we're making some announcements on those uh, when we get to Sham El Sheikh, uh, Sham El Sheikh. But I just want to say that this climate action window is critical for the least, for the low income countries in Africa and also uh, for the transition states that's Let's see whether we can reconnect with President Adeshina, who obviously is in Abidjan at the moment. There might be an internet connection issue. Sorry? Pre no, Pre President Adeshina, please uh, keep going. Uh, we, we lost you for, for 10 seconds. ADF, Climate Action Window, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, please, sir. Okay. I'm actually in, the, in an hotel, so we are here with the African Investment Forum, so the connection may not be as good. Um, if you can hear me, Patrick, can you confirm you can hear me? Yes, very well. All right. right. So I was saying for the climate action window, what will it do? We have a plan that this climate action window will provide 20 million farmers with access to climate resilient agricultural technologies. It will also support 20 million farmers and pastoralists to have access to weather index insurance for ensuring their own livelihoods. It will provide 18 million people with access to water and sanitation. It will also provide 840 billion cubic meters of water because water will be critical for the populations and also provide about 10 million people with access to renewable energy. So in closing, let me just say that as we approach COP27, the message is the same. Africa needs more money for climate finance, Africa needs a lot more money to adapt to climate change that it didn't cause. So we must move from words to commitments, from commitments to action, and then from action to actual delivery of money on the table to support Africa. Because Africa can no longer wait and needs money to adapt to climate change now. Congratulations to you, Patrick.
and all of your team for well well thank you so much uh, uh, president arashina for these very strong words uh, indeed africa can no longer wait it has the solutions they need to be scaled up the africa adaptation acceleration program is the overarching program of and for the continent is working it's moving now we need to develop well to to join this effort indeed an in critical partner in this endeavor is obviously the african union commission so i'm very delighted and honored um that my very close friend and and, and big sister yusufa sako is joining us from the headquarters of the african union commission let's see whether the line is good uh, with uh, Ethiopia. Chair, thank Commissioner, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from Addis Ababa. I hope the, the network is really going to behave well because I'm having problems and having really issues on. Uh, I'm also prepared to acknowledge the presence of my brother, the president, Adesina, in this meeting, this important meeting. I think we need to work together. We need to coordinate together in order to mitigate the effect of climate change. And we have identified a core okay. area, which is adaptation. So, Your <laughs> Excellency Ministers present, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocol duly observed. Uh, I am delighted to be invited by the Global Center on Adaptation to give few remarks at this global launch of its flagship uh, uh, report, State and the Trends in Adaptation in Africa 2022, few days to COP27 in Sham El Sheikh, Egypt, that has been dubbed by uh, African COP or Implementation COP from the point of view of the host country, which is Egypt. It is no longer news that Africa is on the front line of the Africa of the climate emergency, and it's not his fault. We all, we all know that we didn't create this situation. It was already said by, Prof, uh, by uh, President Adeshin and yourself. You gave the statistics. I will just limit myself because of time uh, constraints. So, added to the other overlapping crises, such as the food prices hikes, the infl inflationary uh, pressure, the impact of Russia and the Ukraine crisis on agriculture exports and fertilizers and the unsustainable debt level of our many countries, mostly African countries, we are really having a lot of problems. As reinforced in the report, this report, and uh, I really commend uh, uh, I, I really commend you, Patrick, for your leadership as a CEO of the Global Center and Adaptation and your team for really putting up, bringing up a very comprehensive and a very factual and time, timely uh, report. So what, uh, what are the consequences that uh, uh, the report reinforced? That Africa's 1.4 billion people, around 17% we of the global population, contributes less than 3% of the world total greenhouse gas emission, but finds itself on the front line of this climate emergency, with nine out of 10 most vulnerable countries to climate change in Africa. It is a general acknowledge that uh, adaptation to climate change is very crucial for Africa. We've been saying that, and even our common position that we are going to present next week at the Shama Al Sheikh COP27, it is adaptation that is, is as our, our priority and finance. The sta states and the trends in adaptation 2020, uh, 2022 report, STA 22, the TED in the GCA, a series of annual flagship reports, maintains the ded dedicated focus on Africa from last year's report, the STA, STA 21, and expands its analysis by widening the scope of sector and thematic areas, as well as regional coverage in the report. Overall, it reinforces the findings that was uh, already reported by IPCC, IP, IPCC 20, uh, 2022 six assessment report, which paint a troubling picture that climate change is already impacting 
every corner of the world. And much more severe impact are uh, uh, in store if we fail to have the greenhouse gas em uh, emission this decade and immediately scale up on adaptation. Those are really recommendations that we need to focus on that. The report is the most comprehensive guide to assess progress on climate adaptation in Africa. And it provides guidance and recommendation on best practices in adapting to the effect of climate change and building resilience to climate shocks. While both the 2021 and 2022 reports are complementary and should be read together, the 2022 report has a number of strong points. Let me just go a few of them. The first, it provides updates on the growing impact of climate change on, on African nations from the devastating uh, floods that is hit Niger and Sudan, you have said it in your own presentation, uh, Patrick, to the drought that have uh, grabbed the Horn of Africa where we are here in East Africa. Second, it uses a, a, an in-depth analysis and numerous case study to identify innovative adaptations and resilience idea, resilient ideas, new solution, the most effective regulatory and the legal instrument, and new recommendation for action. We are saying that cop of action, we should go to action, we should showcase, show less, lesson, lesson learned. So I think this report, can be a good report to do the advocacy of the importance of adaptation on the continent. Given the type of most African nations and the initial attention to adaptation, cost and significant benefit, including nature-based solution and locally-led adaptation program. We have our GRAP, which is our initiative to recover the green recovery after COVID pandemic. I think we will work with uh, with um, with you, Patrick, with your, your institution, the GCA, so that we can start implementing the pillar number three of our GRAP through this report. Uh, another innovation, another innovation is that it examines how to accelerate progress in individual sectors such as agriculture and cities. Much more important in the lead to uh, lead up to COP27, TSA22 offers comprehensive recommendations for action based on new evidence that Africa faces a serious uh, shortfall. in funding for climate adaptation cost of the delay action right uh, cumulative adaptation finance one quarter need started by african countries on their national determined contribution in 2019 and 2022 an estimated dr adesina has already said that of 11.4 billion dollars was committed to a uh, climate adaptation finance in africa with more than 90 97 percent of the fund coming from public uh, actors, and less three percent, it was already said by previous speakers from the private sector. This is uh, uh, this is uh, significantly less than this fifty-two point seven billion dollars annually to 10, 2030. It is estimated African countries we need to increase the volume and the uh, e efficacy of adaptation uh, finance flow to Africa over the coming decades. The report makes a number of sensitive recommendations, including boosting the amount of finance that is available for adaptation and using, uh, using that money in the most effective way. Some of the key opportunity lies in the private sector where companies cannot only reduce their own risk from the impact of climate change, but also take advantages of new markets and new, uh, 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 new business as well as innovative finance instruments, such as the debt swap and the blended finance solution. This is uh, the feature for, of adaptation finance. I recall that during our trip into Rotterdam, few months ago, the private sector did not, uh, were not on the table and our head of state were not very happy with it. We, we believe that uh, during this uh, share, uh, 
Sham El Sheikh uh, uh, COP27, they will come so that we can find a solution. Because we need to work together. We are all part of it, and the planet is ours, is our life, is our home. So we need to take care of the planet. I would like to conclude by congratulating GCA and uh, an institution that the African Union is collaborating with, the, with to drive African climate adaptation and resilience agenda for producing is a comprehensive re report. I am sure the content will assist us to boost adapt adaptation funding during the COP27, because this is really demand driven. And this is a, a, a what we call, this is the a bankable project that we can really mobilize a lot of resources. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Muito obrigado, muitas gracias, Sukran. Well, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Yosef Asaka, for your inspiring uh, words and also for your for your reassurance that the analytics is not only uh, demand driven, but it also it will influence the action agenda on the continent in the in the near term future. So, thank you so much. And we look forward to working with you and announcing our joint partnership in the next few days uh, at COP27, uh, indeed. Let us now turn to our next speaker, uh, one of our sort of strong partners within the Global Center on Adaptation, for, uh, one of the founding fathers and founding mothers of the Global Center on Adaptation, the Norwegian State Minister, Björk Sankia. Um, Madam, can I have to give you the floor? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And uh, thanks for launching a great and very useful and important and timely report. We've heard, and it's true, that Africa is the continent with the most to lose from climate change and the most to gain from adapting to the changes. The report launched today shows us that the level of support provided to adaptation falls way short of the needs. That means that our response must be that we deliver in full and on time on our Glasgow commitment on doubling finance flows for adaptation. Norway will do our share. We have committed to doubling climate finance and to triple the support to adaptation by 2026. And uh, Africa is a priority region for us building on Norway's long-standing cooperation with African states. I'm very pleased to learn that the report also gives us reasons to be optimistic. Promising adaptation actions are already underway. The rich examples of ongoing adaptation actions presented in the report gives me hope. I'm happy to note that new innovative approaches to adaptation are emerging in many countries. Proper adaptation measures can ensure resilient and sustainable growth on the African continent. So colleagues, as the report clearly states, we need to accelerate adaptation in agriculture. Africa has the potential to become the world's breadbasket. Instead, Africa south of Sahara imported food for more than $56 billion last year. That is $56 billion that could be better spent on schools, roads, and hospitals. And the solution lies in the African fields, in gardens, and oceans. The right to food is a human right, and food security is the Norwegian government's number one priority. In November, we will launch our new strategy on food security in our development policy. Our focus there will be on small-scale food producers, most of whom are women. And we will work to strengthen productivity and build local value chains and markets. So ladies and gentlemen, public resources are scarce. To boost adaptation finance, we need to look at domestic resource mobilization and unleash investments from the private sector. And the report launched today provides rich examples of how this can be done. Africa has a program for climate adaptation for the continent, and it has been mentioned earlier today, the AAAP, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. The program is African-led and African-owned. 
the AAAP projects will generate truly effective climate adaptation outcomes in food security, in rural livelihoods, it will generate digital solutions and nature-based infrastructure, as well as youth employment. In a few days, the eyes of the world will be on Sharm El Sheikh and COP27. This has been referred to as Africa's COP. And I know many of you will go to Egypt with low expectations. At least I can assure you that Norway will stand by our commitments to scale up climate finance and stand by our commitments to invest in food security and in resilience. We are determined to deliver and to deliver in partnership. The report launched today shows us how. It's now up to all of us to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, State Secretary uh, of Norway, for your very, quite frankly, inspiring uh, words. Indeed, Africa is at a crossroads. And adaptation and development go hand in hand. And it is very reassuring to, to hear, again, that Norway's commitment is strong, uh, it's bold, it's forward-leaning. So we're very much looking forward to work with you uh, in the coming period, including at COP27. So thank you so much, uh, State Secretary, in this regard. Let us turn to the next speaker, Lisbeth Steer. Dr. Steer is the Executive Director of the Education Commission. There's a very important um, component of the report focus on the linkage between education and adaptation, a very uh, uh, much overseen uh, topic, so to say. Lisbeth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you to all the speakers uh, this morning. It's an, and it's, it's an inspiring um, conversation and one that really compels us to act. Um, underlying the climate crisis um, is a human crisis, and low levels of human development make people more vulnerable to impacts of climate change and also prevent them from being part of the climate solutions. And an often uh, missed part of this is the education crisis, as uh, Patrick uh, indicated. We've heard some pretty sobering statistics on the impact of climate change, underlining the urgent need for adaptation. But without education, there is no adaptation. Investments in adaptation will be wasted if citizens are not able to adapt. Adaptation requires flexibility, the ability to do things differently, to adjust to new situations, to acquire new skills. Citizens who are uneducated will not have that capacity. More than 80% of young people in Africa do not have basic literacy and numeracy skills. And on current trends, it will take another 280 years to reach universal secondary education. That's not even talking about further education. So if we can't address this crisis, we will never succeed in making societies and economies more resilient. The report calls for some amazing solutions, climate smart agriculture, more resilient cities, nature-based solutions, the blue economy. It all requires a lot of learning, a lot of new skills, basic and green, in other words, investment in education. Unfortunately, at the moment, education is a missed piece in many climate and adaptation strategies. It is absent uh, in many of them. Traditionally, also, a large part of adaptation finance has been dedicated to physical capital, flood protection, infrastructure. A growing share now is going to natural capital, which is highly positive. But to date, very little has been allocated to human capital. That's the negative side of the story. On the positive side, when education investments are being made, and particularly in secondary education, we actually see that countries' adaptive capacity is significantly higher. That's proven in the evidence. So the report sets out four areas to act. Um, one is to integrate education and adaptation strategies more strongly, including better monitoring and analysis of climate vulnerabilities and climate impacts on education and more finance for this, of course. 
investment in school infrastructure that is also being affected by climate shocks, investment in the human capital of education, teachers, school leaders, and members of the workforce to help them prepare the next generation for this climate adapted world. And we need to invest not only in green skills, but also in basic skills, because those are what actually is the foundation to build these other skills. So we must prepare young people for the green, climate smart, resilient economy of tomorrow. We must educate to adapt. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lisbeth, uh, for your very inspiring words, basically pushing the boundaries of the adaptation agenda by focusing on, on the human capital and on the opportunities and on the bright side of investing in this agenda, particularly in Africa, quite frankly, which is the youngest continent indeed. What better way to start this revolution uh, on linking the education and the adaptation agenda than in Africa? And I think next week at COP27 is indeed a very good starting point in, in this regard. So colleagues and ladies and gentlemen of the press, we will get to you very shortly, but bear with us. I just want to just uh, um, show the brief video message of Amina Mohammed, then give the floor to the co-directors of the report, and then we will turn to you. Uh, Amina, please. Excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the Global Centre for Adaptation for their focus on finding solutions to address Africa's adaptation needs. Current annual spending on adaptation in Africa amounts to $11.4 billion, approximately 39% of total climate finance that is committed to the continent annually. This is a far cry from the $43.1 billion per year that is required to implement the nationally determined contributions for African countries. COP27 must be a turning point. Developed countries must put forward credible plans to double adaptation finance to reach $40 billion a year by 2025. The Secretary General has called for a new business model to deliver adaptation finance by turning adaptation priorities into pipelines of investable projects as outlined in the Adaptation Pipeline Accelerator. In the medium to long term, we need to work towards stronger and more efficient country systems. This means, first, effective and transparent institutions able to lead country responses that are tailored to adaptation challenges. Second, comprehensive and inclusive policy frameworks that guide partnerships with the private sector and drive African innovations. And third, greater domestic resource mobilization from public and private sources to complement international climate finance provided by developed countries. Let's join forces to make COP27 a success and together build a more sustainable, peaceful and a prosperous continent for all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, for recommending how COP27, in very practical terms, can turn into this indeed turning point for this agenda. Um, now, we'd like to turn uh, to the two co directors uh, uh, of the report, Professor Jamal Sagir and uh, Dr. Eda Ildias, uh, both senior advisors at the Global Center on Adaptation. Jamal and Eda, the floor is yours. Jamal, I think you may be still on mute. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Good morning. Thanks, Patrick, for the introduction and for launching GCA report today. This report presents an in-depth analysis from the world's most prominent organization and show the most effective benefit maximizing solution designed and ready now for action for implementation. Commissioner Sacco nicely gave us the structure of the report. Basically, first, we have a groundbreaking analysis and how to boost finance, and you already spoke about it, but also the role of the private sector, which is important. Second, we have a specialized focus on how to accelerate progress in an individual sector, livestock, blue economy, cities, agriculture. Then we had a coverage of cross-sectoral theme for best-in-class adaptation. This is the how to, what to do, how to do, and how to ensure that adaptation solutions are scaled not siloed 
and forming the basis of prosperous, sustainable, and resilient Africa. We all said Africa is particularly vulnerable to extreme impact of climate change. People are food insecure and the number are rising. Africa is also vulnerable in particular because it imports 80% of its food. And the poorest people will bear the, 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 the brunt because they spend 75% of their income on food. Across Africa, more than 280 million people are food insecure and the number are rising. In addition, Inflation has averaged more than 10% since mid-2021, and we're talking about food inflation. May add it to that, the little fiscal space that we have with the government growing food and fuel crisis, the share of low-income country in a high risk of debt distress at 60% now, up from 20% years ago. So the report show us that Africa, as you said, Patrick, is a ground zero. What does it mean? We have 1.4 billion people in Africa, around 17% of the global population. They contribute to almost 3%. Let's put that 3% of CO2 emission in a context. That's equivalent to what the airline business emit per year. We have the airline and we have a continent that are the same, 3%. The last report of IPCC underscored that at 1.5 degree of warming, it will be reality for all by 2030. For Africa, it will be three degrees. We found in our report that water dependent sector across Africa are heavily impacted. In fact, 52 million African people, 4% of the population have been impacted either by drought or flood between January 2021 and last September 2022. This is a good example here about what we are seeing here. Number of people affected in Western Africa by storm, 17,000. Drought, 4,000 or 4,000. If you look at Northern Africa, total injured around 738. And we talk about number of people affected, 16,000. So across the continent, we have the perfect storm of storm, drought, wildfire, flood, and landslide. This is what we've seen. That's what we have witnessed in this report. So now let me turn what it means in particular. This, our review in the report showed that the climate risk for Africa, that food system are particularly vulnerable with a two degree rise, meaning yield reduction for staple cross across most of Africa, rangeland net primary productivity decline by 42% for West Africa by 2050, Marine fishery catch on the western coast of Africa will decline by 10 to 30 percent, and land based species will disappear around 7 to 18 percent. Considering agriculture in Africa provides employment for approximately 60 percent of the population and it's around 25 percent of GDP, it's therefore very critical to keep enhancing the resilience of the sector by mainstreaming adaptation into policies, plan, strategies, and action. Now, standing all of this, as Madam Minister of Norway said, we are optimistic. Africa can still prosper and thrive in a world of climate change. This is development is dependent on understanding, preparing, and adapting to oncoming climate impact. The report takes into account the unique global and regional economic condition. We map out the prosperous road to a continent ready and resilient for a new climate. We have a path of development. It provides also very necessarily detailing of the climate challenges that Africa faces from the flood that hit Niger to the Horn of Africa, where we have the droughts happening right now. Let me now talk to finance, since this is a center to what we have been looking at this, and we have been, my colleague and myself, looking at it very carefully. We talked about the figure. We talked about 53 billion needed, 41 billion gap, the private sector currently provides only 3%. This is not enough, as you said, Patrick. We need to do a better job. It's not just such a size of financing that is needed. Across the MDBs, across the private sector, it's the source of financing we have to look at it. It's the economic model, it's the project finance. And therefore, we have to look at the financial instrument. Our report makes the argument that private sector involvement adaptation Sportletic successful example, and you gave some example. 
Another good example is the UN Green Climate Fund that we need to tap it much more. The African Isolation Program created a technical program important to work on it. We've seen already some results in Burkina Faso, DRC, Niger, Nigeria. Debt to equity swap should be part of the discussion. Issuing of green bond like Egypt has done it, but linked to adaptation, it will be important. Work on partial credit guarantee for non-commercial risk that adaptation could adapt is an important aspect. Finally, when we look at Sub-Saharan Africa and the story of North Africa, we see some differences. North Africa faced an even larger financing gap than Africa as a whole, with total public climate finance between 2010 and 2020 at a level of only 7% of what is needed to meet NDC goal over the next 10 years. And what is more dramatic in North Africa, most of the fund that is coming is loans. They get little concessional funding. Most of the climate finance loan, this is not enough. Let me now hand over to my colleague, Eddie, to get us into the sector of discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamal. And uh, I want to quickly discuss a few of the sectoral issues that we analyze in the report. And in terms of uh, food systems, the main message is that there's no solution to Africa's food crisis without adaptation in the entire food system. As we discussed last year in the State and Trends uh, in Adaptation 2021, the 60% of Sub-Saharan Africans are smallholder farmers. At the same time, a quarter of Africa's GDP is coming from agriculture. And as Patrick was saying, it is striking the difference between how much it costs not to do anything in adaptation. The cost of doing nothing is $200 billion a year while the cost of avoiding all of those expenses from famine to crops loss to food waste to uh, all kinds of issues that are linked to climate impacts, dealing with those tremendous damages only costs $15 billion a year, less than 10%. This year we said, look, we need to look at livestock. Why? Because more than half of the household income in pastoral systems comes from livestock. And they, they, if there is no action on adaptation in the livestock sector, on he, what to do with heat, what to do with the grasslands that are gonna be affected, what to do with the diseases that are going to take place, then as much as 40 billion a year are going to be lost in a sector that is so important to some of the poorest in Africa. At the same time, Africa's blue economy today is worth $300 billion a year and generates almost 50 million jobs. And fish is critical in some of the coastal countries of Africa. It is more than half, it is more than half of the animal protein that inhabitants consume into this process. And there's so much to be done because the impacts of climate change on bleaching corals, on raising temperatures that are going to affect the ecosystems, on that combination of climate change amplifying the unsustainable fishing uh, practices needs to be tackled. And therefore, it is not just crops, it is livestock, it is fisheries, it is agroforestry altogether. And the report goes into a lot of detail into this direction. In terms of the cities, the reality is that Africa is the continent that is urbanizing the fastest, but it's also the continent that has the largest proportion of the population living on informal settlements. And that combination of informal jobs, informal housing and climate risks are closely related. And this year we decided to do a deep dive. We did, for example, the case of, of uh, Accra in Ghana, where 60% of the population are living in informal housing. Now, there, those who live in informal housing, two thirds have informal jobs. About 30% of those work at home and 25% work on the streets, which are some of the most vulnerable areas to climate impacts in Accra. And therefore jobs, housing and livelihoods are at risk. And therefore we come with very practical solutions. It is important to recognize that there's not a lot of resources in these uh, difficult uh, economic situations coming out of COVID pandemic, going into what may be a really difficult global recession and therefore figuring out what are the most practical low cost in situ investments 
how to get help the population in low income communities cope with the shocks of climate, how to do uh, strong land rights in safe areas, how to really make sure that the ideas on adaptation from these communities are at the center of the solution is part of the recommendations that come through. What we also see is that uh, youth entrepreneurship in the adaptation sector is going to be for sure part of the solution. Remember, SMEs today are 95% uh, of uh, Africa's private sector and they generate 80% of the jobs. Now, what we say in the report is that adaptation should not, must not be seen as a cost has to be seen as a business opportunities. And actually the youth adapt challenge in the, um, as part of the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program is supporting uh, innovative young entrepreneurs. Uh, and examples are uh, a company that uses drones to find trash that is clogging urban canals before the floods come in, or climate smart digital agricultural services to farmers or solar power smart irrigation to make sure that you don't waste water, but you're also irrigating exactly at the time that plants needed, that crops needed in that process. And it is these entrepreneurs that give us the most hope for the continent to be able to find adaptation solutions. Because if there is not a strong, a vibrant ecosystem of SMEs, there's no hope for Africa to be able to become resilient, to move into resilient and adaptive. Lisbeth talk about the major dry, direct and indirect impacts of climate change on education and how adaptation is at the core of the educational achievements of Africa. But at the same time, education is part of adaptation action because it can build the human capital so that households, communities, nations become more resilient to climate change. And because this new generation, the generation that today is in schools are going to be entering the labor force when the impacts of climate change are going to be significantly higher. And therefore they need, they need the skills for climate adaptation and that needs to be part of the educational system. Finally, we really discuss the issue of security and adaptation because Climate change may not be the only factor for conflict, but it amplifies, it enlarges the root causes of conflict that is still that exist in the African continent. And therefore, security and adaptation have to work hand in hand in terms of data, in terms of joint early warning systems for conflict and for climate shocks, in terms of joint prevention and preparedness. It is important that actions that are taken to enhance the security of uh, countries in Africa take into account the shocks of climate and vice versa. Adaptation measures should not amplify the root causes of conflict. And importantly, climate change and conflict really know no, no, no boundaries. And therefore, transboundary solutions combined with local actions are important characteristics of security actions and climate adaptation. So we invite you to read and explore more in this report. As uh, Patrick said, this report and last year report is about a thousand pages of uh, adaptation analysis, solutions, practical policies moving forward. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jamal and Edda, for this uh, uh, technical deep dive in the report uh, itself. And indeed, as you just summarized, Edda, what we, uh, what we try to uh, achieve through this report, through this encyclopedia on the climate adaptation for and on Africa, we try to be extremely practical in what we can do as global community, as African community, together um, as we move forward. Uh, let me now move to um, Alex G. Alex G is the climate, uh, the communication director at the Global Center on Adaptation. Uh, Alex, uh, please, we're now turning to our colleagues uh, from from Global Media. It's over to you. Yeah, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Ede and Jamal, for your insightful presentation. Um, so, please, can I remind the media to ask your questions in the Q and A section and to state your name and your media outlet. Um, where possible, we will try and bring you up on screen to ask your question live. Um, so we'll firstly go to CNBC Africa and then Norvan Reports and then Financial Africa. 
Um, unfortunately, CNBC Africa, we can't bring you up on screen because you haven't identified yourself on the link. So let me ask uh, your question uh, to Patrick and the panelists directly. So Akeen from CNBC Africa says, most African countries are severely impacted by either flooding or drought, and in some cases, both. It appears most African leaders are taking the reactive stance instead of the proactive. They also have not made much effort in terms of budgetary allocation for this. How much is the GCA and the African Development Bank getting out from engagements and dialogue with these leaders? So, Patrick, I don't know if you want to take that question yes. first. Yeah. yeah, please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, a colleague from CNBC Africa, indeed, in terms of mobilizing political leadership on this, on this agenda. And indeed, climate finance is critical in this regard. We've seen the numbers in the report, how much is needed on an annual basis, over 50 billion US dollars. How much is flowing to adaptation finance, just over 11 billion, i.e. there is a massive uh, adaptation finance gap, indeed, of of approximately 40 billion. So over the last 18 months, what we have seen is that African leaders together with global leaders have joined forces in putting a concrete program on the table. So under the leadership of the African Union uh, chairperson, uh, President Macky Sall and his colleagues, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program was conceptualized. The good news is, of this 25 billion US dollars program, during the first 18 months, over $3.5 billion of financing has been influenced. Is that enough? No, it is not. But what it demonstrates is that finance is flowing, that this investment program is practical. What now is needed is quite frankly, a turning of the table. Africa leaders came to the Netherlands on September 5, where they met with their uh, counterparts from the global north. And they reminded all of us is that, well, a year ago in Glasgow, the adaptation finance commitment was seen as the breakthrough of, um, of the Glasgow uh, outcomes. Now in a few days during the Africa Cup, there's nothing less what the African leaders are expecting. They're putting their own money where their mouth is. They've put a plan on the table. The leadership is there. The commitment is there. Now the rest of the world has to play ball and has to come forward. So early next week, there will be a leaders dialogue convened under the chairmanship of President Macky Sall and the Dutch Prime Minister, Prime Minister Mark Rutte. And I think it's all to play for to see what comes out of it. As we said at the beginning of this conversation for Africa, this is not a trivial matter. It is adapt or die. And for that, financing has to flow. Great, thank you, Patrick. The next question is from Aqua at Northern Reports. Um, he says, what we have noticed is that the real culprits of climate destruction, Westerners and large industries, over the years have only played lip services with promises Question is, how do you get these Westerners at COP27 meeting to put their money on the table for climate adaptation in Africa, considering the various findings of this report? And then, as you've already alluded to, Patrick, if Africa doesn't get the projected funding for climate adaptation financing, what happens? Yeah, so let me just address the, try to address that uh, hat on in terms of the lip servicing of these uh, uh, global summits. I think the, the importance of next week's climate summit cannot be overstated. The world has to deliver on the promises they have made. The world has promised $100 billion a year flowing from the global north to the global south. The world has promised to double adaptation finance. And yes, it's understandable that the Ukraine crisis and the inflation, which is driven from that, derived from the crisis, is basically um, um, undermining the financial commitments on, on, on climate. But let us not forget the investments which are being provided on the table for, in this case, Africa. It's also good for the rest of the world because the consequences of the climate crisis will not stop in Africa. The World Bank has estimated that in the coming years, approximately 82 million people 
will leave their houses because of the climate crisis, a subset of these 82 million people will come to the shores of Europe. It is much better, much more effective, much more humane to invest in adaptation in Africa. It's good for Africa and it's good for the world. Thank you, Patrick. Now, hopefully through the wonders of modern technology, we will be able to bring up live Jide Akatunde. I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, the managing editor of Financial Nigeria. So Jide, over to you. You're on mute, Jide. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here. I have two questions. Um, one of the questions has actually been echoed, but I will ask my question nevertheless. So we see that there has been a trend in development whereby uh, there is this um, dependency on external financing of development in Africa. And this dependency is often met with disappointment. And so I would like to ask, um, do we have any real hope that with regard to financing adaptation, that the external component of it uh, will materialize and not that this is going to extend the horrible uh, trend of, of, of uh, dependency and disappointment. Then my second question is, um, I am not aware that the program of um, the GCA covers Nigeria. So I would like to find out what is your outlook on um, expanding your program on adaptation uh, to Nigeria. Thank you very much. Why don't we go to Jamal for the first question and, and Edda for the second. You're muted, Jamal. We should not be too pessimistic. The continent has been raising funds for adaptation, tapping on the Green Fund, tapping on the World Bank, the African European Bank, EIB. So some money is coming that will help adaptation. But the needs are so enormous that what is being put right now is not sufficient to keep us at the 1.5 Celsius in terms of the objective. So we shouldn't be that negative, actually. We need to scale up, we need to speed up, we need to be much more innovative, and we need to tap more fund. And we need, as the CEO said, put pressure on delivering what was promised. Something is happening, it's not enough. I am concerned about the private sector. You show the figure of 3%. 3% will not gonna take us anyway. Why the private sector is not funding enough? Because the enabling environment on which adaptation bank or project are not sufficiently well prepared. That's we at GCA are doing right now, working with the IFI to be able to prepare such kind of project and make them much more realistic. On the Nigeria, since I know a bit about it, actually we have project. We work with the African Development Bank on agriculture. We are now a major project of $600 million that the World Bank has proposed to us where we will support them. We are definitely working in Nigeria. We're working on the most vulnerable area. And we need to diversify the portfolio to work more than agriculture, tackle issue of infrastructure, locally led in transport sector. This is what the CEO is instructing us to work on right now. And we are putting an effort, pushing also the international community to put much more effort on this issue because Nigeria need that leapfrog on adaptation. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Um, so we have a sort of another question from Bakri Dabo at allafrica.com, which sort of goes into what you've just covered slightly, Jamal, if you want to give more context. It says, he says, in the search for financing, how much concretely do you expect from the African private sector to hope to fill the gap? They need to go 10 times more than what they have been doing right now. A 3% is not enough. I would love to see a mixture of, if you ask me my personal point of view, uh, looking at the project finance part of it, the private sector should pick up at least 30% in the next 10 years, going to 40%. We cannot rely on only concessional funding 
and donors to put money or even public money. The fiscal space is so limited. And with the crisis that we are facing, we're not going to have a lot. The IMF is doing a good job in putting a new instrument in place, debt equity swap, green bond. Working with the IMF will free some of that fiscal space so that the private sector could invest and we can leverage. It's all about leverage. The money that we put, the money that the donors put, has to leverage. And it's about public and private partnership that we would like to see more of it. But we cannot have the private done properly if the public is not putting enough on the table. That's how the leverage will happen. And that's what we at GCA thinking about and pushing for it. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. And I'd like to call on you again as the French speaker. We have a question from um, the Senegalese outlet, La Tuaco. I will take the Senegalese question, uh, uh, Alex, if you don't mind. Yeah. OK, well, I'm going to... Try and translate it from French to English quickly. Um, so, first of all, um, what commitments do you see coming from certain countries following your engagements with them? The second question is, you know, a number of African countries, they still need to industrialize to develop. How does that fit with adaptation? And finally, I will take the f yeah. finally, how do you see the private sector being incorporated into efforts to adapt? Yeah, so I think the private sector will be covered. But first, on the, on the Senegalese uh, part, the reason why I'm so keen to, to respond to this particular question, because first and foremost, I would like to congratulate President Macky Sall. Uh, President Macky Sall of, of, of Senegal, also this year, the chairperson of the African Union, is doing an extraordinary job in putting adaptation at the heart of the development agenda of the continent. And for that, he is um, putting his money or the country's money where its mouth is. I mean, let us not forget that today, Senegal is losing 10% of its GDP because of its uh, annually recurring floods. So putting adaptation at the heart of the development agenda in Senegal itself is quite frankly sort of uh, under the leadership of the president. So President Macky Sall, as I alluded to, has traveled the world and has come to the Netherlands uh, two months ago where he met with other uh, global leaders where he put this Africa plan on the table. $25 billion over five years of which half of which is already on the table, is already capitalized. What he has indicated on September 5 and recently and will indicate in the coming days at COP27, the AAAP, Africa's investment plan on adaptation. As President Adashina indicated, this is the largest adaptation program in the world. It has to be mobilized. There are two instruments. One, as President Adashina indicated, the ADF climate window. And at the same time, there is the AAAP upstream financing facility. The upstream financing facility is just $200 million. But why is it so important to invest? Because it has a leverage ratio of one to 100. One euro, one pound, one dollar invested in the upstream financing facility will influence um, a ratio of 100 of a pound, a euro, or a dollar in that regard. Investments of the IFIs, the investment uh, financing uh, facilities, they need to be mainstreamed with climate adaptation. Um, Edda, do you want to take the second question in terms of the industrialization needs or the development needs of uh, Africa and how it relates to adaptation? So industrialization is fundamental for the economic development of Africa, but the risk of climate change to industrialization are growing year by year. Uh, growing industry needs to take into account the risk of floods, the risk of droughts, the risk of heating, not only of today. Of course, they need to be prepared for the disasters of today as the first step, but they also need to consider what are the risks of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The industries in Africa, all the way from industries such as in the agricultural sector to uh, cleaner industries like uh, tourism, and fishery management are also tremendously dependent on natural ecosystems that are quite fragile to the impacts of climate change. At the same time, 
Africa has tremendous uh, wealth in terms of nature and ecosystems, and it has a unique opportunity to protect those ecosystems in a way that serves as a buffer against those impacts of climate change. So industrialization is not something that needs to be seen as a dirty polluting. Africa has the opportunity to move into an industrialization that is based on circular economy that considers nature and that at the same time is ready for the disasters of today and the shocks of tomorrow that are going to be more uh, intense and more frequent due to climate change. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ede. And um, thank you very much to all the members from the media who've dialed in and asked questions today. We're already 20 minutes over time, so I'm afraid we haven't had time to get to everybody. Can I ask that you send any follow-up questions to info at gca.org? That's info at gca.org, and we will endeavour to get back to you. I'm now delighted to hand the floor back to Patrick. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alex, for moderating this part. And also particularly thank you for colleagues of, uh, of the global media for attending this launch event of State and Trends on Adaptation 2022. With just a few days before COP27, the critical importance of elevating adaptation finance for the continent, for Africa, cannot be overstated. We have to, the international community has to come through on their original promises. For Africa, it's adapt or die. But the good news is that through our report, we have seen and recorded that adaptation solutions exist. There are practical solutions across the continent. What do they need? They need scale. What do they need else? They need speed. So the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program gives a catalyst, a, a lift to these initiatives. COP27 will succeed or fail, and it will depend and it will hinge on whether the financing will come through. There is a lot to play for in the coming days running into COP27, and I count on your strong engagement and following this through with us as we march along. Because quite frankly, the adaptation revolution is unstoppable, and within that, Africa is unstoppable. I thank you very much indeed. Greetings from uh, Geneva. Uh, thanks for, for the invitation to uh, address you. And I'm sorry that I cannot be physically with you, but I'm happy to deliver my intervention through this, uh, this video. And we are talking about the climate adaptation. Uh, we, we all know that the negative trend in weather patterns will continue for the coming decades. Anyhow, and in 2060s, we could see a phase out if we are successful with mitigation. And that, that means uh, storms, uh, uh, flooding, drought, heat wave uh, type of uh, disasters. But one game we have already lost, and, and that's, uh, that's uh, melting of glaciers and sea level rise. Uh, we have already such a high concentration of carbon dioxide, and it's still rising that we will, we will see the sea level rise and uh, melting of glaciers to, to be continued for the coming hundreds of years anyhow. WMO is the UN Specialized Agency of Weather, Climate and Water, as you all, all know, and, uh, and, and we are very much dealing with uh, national meteorological and hydrological services, with academic institutions, and also with private sector nowadays. And we are, for example, hosting IPCC, and uh, we are one of the key players inside the UN family to advise, for example, Secretary General Guterres on climate matters. And climate change is the biggest uh, challenge for the mankind uh, this century. And that was also confirmed by the World Economic Forum uh, this uh, June, where they estimated which are the biggest risks for the global economy for the com during the coming 10 years. And you can see that climate action fa fa failure is number one, and extreme weather events there are number two. Uh, this uh, uh, war in Ukraine is hopefully going to have all, only a small impact uh, on 10 years scale. Ho I hope that that's, that's, that's a valid scheme. And then uh, we have shown that the warming has uh, continued and, uh, and we can see this kind of year-to-year -year variation, which is very much related to El Niño, La Niña variation. And uh, for example, last year was uh, La Niña year, uh, actually a third such year in row. And that's why we saw this anomaly in the Pacific uh, Ocean 
but for example, the Eurasian continent has been warming uh, much more than the global average. And we have stored an, uh, more than 90% of the excess heat to ocean, and oceans have been warming, and that's giving more energy for tropical storms, and it's also enhancing evaporation, uh, contributing to the flooding uh, problem. And we just published uh, greenhouse gas uh, report uh, a few days ago where we showed that in all of the key greenhouse gases carbon dioxide methane and nitrous oxide we have again broken records and uh, and in case of methane we saw the the biggest annual increase uh, last year since uh, that was the highest since 83 when we started this kind of reporting. An IPCC report is showing that we have seen an increase in, in flooding events worldwide. All these green symbols indicate areas where we have seen increase in flooding. And you can see, for example, that the, almost the whole Eurasian continent has seen increase in, increase in flooding, flooding events. And that's the case also for many part, other parts of the world. And, and we have seen also uh, increase of uh, drought events. And, and that's, uh, that's valid also for some parts of Eurasian continent, Africa, both Americas and uh, Australia. And then uh, one of the challenges, as I already said, is, is the melting of uh, glaciers. And this melting of glaciers has been speeding up. Uh, and that's bad news when it comes to availability of uh, freshwater resources to the reverse worldwide. And the next uh, slide uh, shows uh, the ratio between uh, uh, freshwater in, in the reverse coming from rainfall and, and coming from uh, cryosphere, and you can see that, uh, for example, in in Central Asia, uh, uh, largest fraction of the fresh water is coming from the melting of glaciers, and also a big fraction is coming, uh, for example, to many, many Asian rivers. Uh, in uh, from Rocky Mountains, we we have lots of rivers uh, water coming from uh, from uh, to the U.S. rivers, and also uh, in in Latin America, the Andes. Uh, the melting is uh, contributing to the amount of water in the, in the rivers. Globally, it's still dominated by uh, rainfall, but this uh, component coming from glacier melting is uh, also very important. And we have started reporting on the status of uh, water resources. And here is uh, water storage trend for the, for the past uh, 20 years. And uh, all these uh, 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 brown and orange colors indicate uh, decrease of uh, water storage season, you can see it happening uh, again in Eurasian continent, uh, largely and parts of uh, North America and uh, parts of uh, South America especially. And we have seen also increases in, for example, in some parts of Africa and some parts of uh, uh, both Americas. And, and one of the main concerns related to climate change is, going to, uh, is, is the question how to feed the growing global population. And if we go to three degrees warming, which is uh, uh, our, our pathway at the moment, uh, hopefully we will go to lower numbers uh, with uh, successful mitigation. But in case of 3D, uh, 3 degrees warming, we would lose a uh, large fraction of the global food production capacity. And you, you can see lots of red areas which indicate the decrease. And then we have increases in, in the green areas, but those are not uh, the most suitable areas for agricultural production. So it's a net effect we would lose the global food production capacity. And one problem besides uh, greenhouse gas emissions is uh, related to population growth. This is, uh, of course, contributing to the victims of uh, climate change, but it's also contributing to the consumers, and it's also contributing to the water resource demand. And here you can, on this map, you can see areas where, where, the, where both, both population growth and uh, uh, water availability is going to be a challenge. And, and it's lots of uh, dark color in Africa, Middle East and, uh, and some parts of uh, southwestern Asia. Sea level rise has been doubly, doubled during the past uh, uh, 20 years. It used to be about 2 millimeters per year. And recently we have seen numbers exceeding 4 millimeters per year. And there's a growing component coming from melting of uh, Greenland and uh, Antarctic glacier, where we have the biggest uh, biggest mass and big, biggest potential during the coming decades. IPCC published its uh, uh, 1.5 degree report already four years ago. And there they demonstrated to re that if to, to, to reach 1.5 degrees warming, we should bend this emission growth curve in the coming uh, this decade, actually, and, and then be carbon neutral by 2050. And in Glasgow, uh, the G7 and European Union countries made such commitments to keep it, uh, keep it on, on that pathway. 
But unfortunately, some other countries were not able to do so. And at the moment, we are heading to bo towards 2.5 to 3 degrees warming. No more towards 3 to 5 degrees, which was the worst case scenario from the previous IPCC report in 2014. So things have been happening, but uh, we, we still have a major challenge ahead of us. And the most recent IPCC uh, working group, the tree report, was demonstrating how to reduce uh, the emissions, which are the most effective means, which is indicated by the length of these bars. And you can see that uh, for solar and wind energy, they are very effective ways to, uh, to mitigate and, uh, and they are also fairly cheap ways to mitigate. These uh, colors indicate the uh, price and, and, uh, and they, are, they are fairly low price means to be successful. Then we have also several uh, high bars coming from the land use, both agriculture and, and, and forestry. And, and there's also a big potential, but the means are more expensive. And then we have plenty of means in transport sector, which are these uh, short blue bars uh, in, in the lower part of the, of the graph. Altogether, this means a lot, and, and, and there are also potential uh, means uh, in, in, in that sector. And finally, I'd like to say a few words about the key initiatives of WMO for the, for the coming, coming years and also for the forthcoming COP27 meeting and, uh, and UN Water Conference and, uh, and also other, other meetings, and of course COP28 uh, next year. First, we got the mandate from Secretary General Guterres to prepare an action plan to, to get 100% coverage of early warning services. At the moment, only half of our members have proper early warning services in place. And we are supposed to improve the situation in the coming five years so that there would be 100% coverage of multi-hazard early warning services and also impact-based forecasting. Then we are proposing a new way to monitor greenhouse gas budgets, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide uh, to use uh, ground-based uh, satellite and modeling tools to, si to, to simulate what's happening in real atmosphere. And finally, our third uh, dream is that uh, we should create a global climate modeling center where we would have the biggest possible supercomputing resources to be, to be able to go to higher resolution of climate uh, modeling. The current uh, climate models are not able to describe, uh, for example, the rainfall amounts in a proper way, extreme weather events a proper way, or, or melting of, uh, for example, Antarctic uh, glacier in a proper way. And, and, and that's, that's very much uh, needed to, be, to, to, to have more information on, on what's going to happen, happen in the future. At the moment, the models are too coarse for, the, for such uh, purposes. And this early warning is for all. We got the mandate from Secretary General Guterres last uh, spring to prepare an action plan, and that's what we have uh, done and, and we expect to get uh, support by, by the uh, UNFCCC member countries uh, in the coming weeks for that initiative. And globally, uh, only half of our members have uh, proper early warning services in place. It varies from region to region, for example, uh, in Africa, it, it's only half and, and the same is true for Oceania, whereas in Latin America and Europe, the ratio is uh, a bit higher. And our plan is to transfer the good know-how of the developed world and advanced med services to the rest of the countries. And besides investments in early warning service capacity, we have to invest in the basic infrastructures. For example, we have major gaps in the observing systems in Africa, Caribbean, Pacific Islands and some parts of Latin America. And that's valid for these ground-based stations. And it's also valid for the, for the balloon sounding stations. And, and if we don't get input data from those regions, the uh, quality of early warning services is automatically poor. And then we also have to invest in, uh, invest in hydrological observing systems and related services and better integration of meteorological and hydrological services at the national level. And we have, we have been lucky to work uh, as a joint venture between uh, uh, 10 UN agencies to prepare such an action plan. And we have been assisted by high-level panel consisting of heads of state, the ministers and uh, other key, key players uh, from, from various uh, sectors. And then, uh, uh, then we have another initiative uh, on, on, on carbon dioxide budget. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, problems with uh, understanding of the sinks of carbon dioxide, for example, the forests. And we have also uh, uh, limitations in our understanding of uh, sources of methane. And, and, and here you can see that in some areas of this, uh, this uh, carbon budget, for example, 
we have a good understanding, but, uh, but especially this uh, land sink of uh, carbon dioxide has very, uh, very high error bars. And, and by having this new mean, we could have better understanding what's happening in real atmosphere. And the idea is that we would use already existing global atmosphere watch station where we have about 150 stations worldwide and some aircraft and vessel measurements. We have satellite programs from China, Japan and, and USA and soon a couple of Europeans. And we have also modeling and assimilation tools. And by doing so, we could create a system to monitor what's happening in real atmosphere instead of relying on reporting of the countries. And our final dream is to improve this glo global uh, climate modeling. This is uh, an estimation from IPCC, uh, what, what may happen to soil moisture and rainfall in the future. And it's likely that these, uh, these estimates contain fairly big errors and, and the impacts of climate change, they are very, very much felt uh, through water and also soil moisture, which is uh, driving agriculture. And, and also these extreme weather events and melting of uh, Glaciers uh, cannot be described in a proper way with the current climate model models. And that's why we would like to create a center where we have uh, big supercomputing resources and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, dozens of, uh, of leading scientists to run, run such an exercise. We are elaborating that uh, further and, uh, and we would like to come out with the concrete uh, action plan during the coming months. So with these words, uh, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to address you and uh, I would like to wish you a most successful adaptation meeting. Thank you.